It's a few days now since we had that devastating earthquake in Myanmar and some of the surrounding areas. What are the takeaways for you as we're starting to get more information coming out after this event? Yes, well, it's a very large earthquake, magnitude 7.7, quite shallow in an area that's well known. It's very actively seismic. Sadly, that's the numbers are being reported right now are sadly likely to be an underestimate of the total number of casualties eventually. But in terms of the earthquake itself, some of the analysis I've been seeing over the last couple of days, it's suggesting that the rupture length was very long and that it ruptured very, very fast. So... Typically, for a magnitude 7.7 earthquake, you might expect about 200 kilometers length of rupture. But there are indications, and there isn't great instrumentation in this area, but as I've seen analysis from USGS and scientists from the Thai Earthquake Observation Division that are suggesting that the rupture length could have been well over 300 kilometers, and it would have been ruptured very, very fast, and this would have caused very high ground shaking the sort of ground shaking that you might have got from a larger magnitude earthquake, but with a shorter rupture. So that could be why there's such high shaking, for example, in Bangkok. It's about 1,000 kilometres south of the epicentre, but only 600 kilometres away from the southern end of that rupture. And why is Myanmar itself a tragedy, of course, from an insurance perspective, not so many major insured exposures out there, but Thailand itself as a a sort of developing country, saw a lot of the losses back in the Thai floods a few years ago. What are we sort of learning about the experience for those buildings in, in Bangkok itself and the surrounding area? Yes, so the insurance situation will be, particularly for commercial buildings, would typically be included for earthquake risk. From homeowners' perspective, probably not so much, but it's really the high-rise commercial buildings in downtown Bangkok that we've seen quite this very severe shaking, which is a consequence of that combination of that long rupture length and also the soil that Bangkok is built on. It's thick layers of soft clay soil, and these sorts of soils are known to amplify ground shaking significantly by as much as three to five times. It's similar to the effect that happened in Mexico City, where this effect exacerbated damage in 1985 from a very large earthquake that happened then. And there's many cities around the world that are known to be very prone to this sort of soil amplification effect. The combination of the long rupture, big magnitude earthquake far away, and these soft soils creates very long duration seismic waves. So short buildings will react to shorter seismic waves and the tall buildings react to these long seismic waves. So that's why we've seen so much dramatic swaying of these buildings. Since the late 2000s, it's an effect that have been captured in major catastrophe models called seismic response-based vulnerability curves, and it's accounting for the soil type that the city is standing on. So important to check if you're using earthquake models, that your models take those types of factors into account. Thanks, Claire. Andy, you were originally an engineer at Ovara designing buildings to be earthquake resistant, and you're now CEO of SafeHub. You're putting sensors on buildings to address one of the issues that Claire mentioned about getting access to accurate data. We've seen on the news this building that was under construction that collapsed. What, in, in your experience, is particularly vulnerable about buildings under construction? I mean, one of the tragic things that we've seen, of course, is the extensive damage in the epicentral area in Myanmar. With such a shallow earthquake, 10 kilometers, we would actually expect more damage confined to a smaller area, not spread out so far. So it is interesting and tragic that there was shaking as far away as Bangkok. Now, you know, that was recorded or estimated by the United States Geological survey based upon some did you feel it readings to be estimated to be an intensity of four or five, which is felt, but you wouldn't expect any real damage. Now, something that we did see there is that there was a tall building under construction that that collapsed. Now, buildings under construction are generally more vulnerable to earthquakes than buildings that have been completed in the operation phase. I mean, partly that is just by the nature of the construction of buildings. There are times during the construction of that building that you're going to have a lot of the mass of the structure, which attracts force from the shaking of the ground, but you don't have the strength, right? So you have the mass that needs to be resisted by the strength of the structure, but you don't have that. And so for a concrete frame building like we've seen here, it is possible, and and again, I have no insight into this, but it is possible that perhaps on the upper floors, you had a situation where the concrete had been poured 
the mass of that concrete was there, but you didn't have the strength of that concrete. It hadn't formed yet because it hadn't hardened in the columns and the slabs. If you do get failure of one floor, if you get the entire slab because the columns fail, falling down to the next slab, to the next floor, whether that building is in construction or not, that floor won't be able to sustain the energy of an entire floor falling onto it. And so therefore that floor will fall. And then you'll get the classic pancaking of buildings. Now, whether that happened in this situation, I have absolutely no idea. I will say that throughout the world, buildings in construction are generally more vulnerable to earthquakes than buildings that are not in construction. They are designed to be resisted at different phases of construction to withstand smaller earthquakes than there would be during a building in operation. The chance of experiencing a larger earthquake is less during the couple of years of construction than it is you know, in the operation phase for the 30 to 50 years of operation. Claire, so you heard Andy there talking about some of the challenges for buildings under construction. There's a specific class of insurance coverage. Can you just talk a little bit more about how that works, how we should think about that in the context of earthquakes? My understanding is that the building was covered what's called a contractor or risk policy. So these are the typical types of policies that are written for under construction buildings, hydropower plants, any big type of construction. The total sum insured, I believe, is around about $65 million shared among four insurance companies. I don't know what their reinsurance situation is. They're currently assessing the damage, but these construction risk policies, they cover damage to the building itself. Obviously, in this case, it's a total loss, total destruction, but also machinery, construction machinery being used on site. And also, interestingly, business interruption, because obviously this is going to put back the completion of that building very substantially. So there would be an impact to the revenue implications from that building as well. So construction risk policies would typically cover damage, business interruption and construction machinery. And they're typically multi-year policies to cover the duration of the construction. But what you get is an increase in the insured value each year, increased automatically over time to account for the fact that there is more building value as the construction progresses. And within catastrophe models, there are often some models have specialist modules known as builders risk models that capture that automatic sort of change in value, but also how the vulnerability of the building changes through time. Well, thanks, Claire. In mean, conclusion, all earthquakes are tragic. This one, particularly in minor mile building construction, is even more vulnerable, obviously much closer to the earthquake. In insurance terms, relatively minor, but a reminder as we talk about other perils such as severe convective storm, wildfire, flooding, a reminder that the earthquakes still do happen and could actually have a very significant impact in many areas of the world and particularly you know, in some of the insurance loss potentials. So hopefully that's not a topic we'll need to address this year, but we will be coming back with other catastrophes as they evolve and the lessons that can be learned from those.